What's going on, everyone? My name is Scott Gearman. Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. I'm joined by managing editor Blake Williams of Dodger Blue. Blake, we had an off day. It's, it's been good. It's, it's it felt much needed after the road trip. Uh, I know I relaxed. I got to relax, take a day, just watch other teams around the league. What'd you do, man? Yeah, so on the off day, I went to the beach, actually, did some work there, played football, got sunburned a bit. And the day before that, I had a little Disneyland trip for a few hours. So it's good kind of day and a half off there, but good to be back now and ready for the Dodgers to play again. Absolutely. You know, big series coming up against the Padres at home. Uh, some good pitching matchups there. I know it's not premier winning, but we do have Yamamoto. We've got Gavin Stone and we've got Bla uh, James Paxton there, the big maple. A lot of stuff to talk about there. It's been an eventful few days. I know yesterday the Shohei Otani news broke. A lot of fantastic stuff there from a Dodgers fan perspective, baseball fan standpoint as well. Uh, it seemed like they were too, uh, luckily enough to avoid some really big news with that. Uh, the outcome that Major League Baseball really needed from a PR standpoint kind of broke and, and, and feels like Shohei Otani is kind of in the clear. Real quick, we don't have to get into that. I just I missed you yesterday talking about this stuff, and I really wanted to get your perspective. Just a slight bit on the matter. Don't have to go too much. Just on from what you got to see, and how your initial reactions of it, you know, kind of how did you, how were you able to digest all of that info? Yeah, so I was kind of reading through the entire document that came out, and it's pretty interesting read. There are some wild parts, some funny parts, like definitely worth going over if you haven't yet. But it's just good to see Shohei's cleared. It's good for the Dodgers. It's good for fans. It's good for Major League Baseball. And it seems like every question we had was answered I know a lot of people on social media still have some questions about it, like maybe more of the trolls having questions and trying to set it up to be like, oh, yeah, he's he is actually guilty and we didn't get this answered or whatnot. But the investigation was pretty thorough. Pretty much everything was answered. And it's good just to focus on baseball again now and kind of get past all that stuff with Otani and the investigation there. Absolutely. I'm totally with you. So we can look ahead. We can look ahead to this Padres series. Uh, we can kind of really get into that because it's a it's a very interesting one. It kind of feels the Dodgers are playing solid baseball, you know, coming into the days uh, 10 and five sitting atop National League West, which is fantastic. But it kind of feels like they're they're holding back a little bit or there's some things that are kind of misfiring uh, lower third of the order and what have you. You can pick and choose. Uh, but we just want to look strictly at the pitching matchups for this one. See how you can dissect each one, uh, which game the Dodgers look this might have some advantage in which way or another or where the offense is kind of have you know a tough thing we've got a knuckleballer mixed in there but start with game one on Friday night we've got Michael King Yoshinobu Yamamoto uh, Michael King we got to see a little bit in the Soul Series uh, first game or second game so a little bit you know take it with a little bit of a grain of salt there he struggled recently even uh, he struggled with the walks he walked seven on March 31st but the Dodgers have seen him before they got to touch him up a little bit um, anything from Michael King there? Do you remember anything from the Soul Series? Um, not too much. That was a crazy game that kind of got lost. That was the 15 to 11 game he appeared yeah. in and seemed like no pitcher really had anything working for them. So I'm not going to put too much stock in that outing. Michael King was the guy that uh, Padres got as kind of the main piece in their Juan Soto trade there. So the Padres definitely have high hopes for him and the Yankees were kind of hesitant to trade him, but at the end of the day, you're getting Juan Soto and you're going to have to give up some talent there. So yeah. King is a solid pitcher. He still has some stuff he needs to put together and kind of take that next step into maybe becoming more of a number two or an ace tier type starter instead of he's more like a number three kind of pitcher right now. So there's upside there. It'll be interesting to see how the Dodgers deal with him again. And if he can kind of rebound after this whole series, because I think a lot of the pitchers just struggled overall there and you can't sure. put too much stock into that series just because so much travel, so much going on. Just there's a lot there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Michael King, even his last, last out and he went seven innings, uh, no earn four strikeouts against the San Francisco giants. Uh, so it's definitely not someone to overlook, uh, but Yamamoto gets to go on Friday. Uh, you know, he gets to go tonight. I'm really excited about it. He's had back-to-back -back outings, five innings, no earned runs, Struck out eight against the Cubs. I know we walked the tightrope. Uh, had to work out some bases loaded jams there. So you can pick and choose what you really want to pull away from that. Uh, is there anything from Yamamoto in particular that you saw in his last outing or that you're looking forward to on Friday night that uh, makes you believe that he didn't just walk a tightrope and that you got to see him pitch 
uh, and it was a real true test. So from Yamamoto, Blake, uh, do you feel like he's getting more of a grasp of the major league game? I think so. I think he's definitely improved a bit in each start in one specific area. He did kind of get into a little bit of a jam, but he was able to work out of that and not let it spiral on him, which is a great step you want to see from a pitcher. But I think at this point, it's kind of just about going deeper into games, starting to build Mm -hmm. up and work deeper now and kind of like show that ace level stuff we've expected from him because, or I should say the stuff is elite. It's just about putting that all together now, going out there, keeping the pitch count lower and kind of just doing what we expect from him. Like the Dodgers had so much praise for his command. I would like to see that a little more. And I think that'll help him kind of get that pitch count down and go deeper into the games like we want to see from him. But he has been improving each start. And I think he's going to continue to do that because he's an incredibly talented pitcher. Yeah, well said. I mean, you know, you look at his pitch counts. He's built up each time, reached the 80, reached the 80 pitch mark in his most recent one, recent one against the Cubs. So you can see that 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 climb up there. Uh, results wise, it's not as efficient and clean as you would like to see it. I know the but the box score says otherwise. Uh, but inning to inning, uh, you can see him. From my perspective, you can see him uh, get more of a grasp on how he's sequencing and really locating there. Because just like you said, this stuff is elite. It's it's among the best in Major League Baseball when it's on. He just has to put it all together. Uh, but Saturday. This is the interesting one. This is a nightmare from MLB The Show. We have to see Matt Waldron and, and a knuckleballer. That's something you just Dodger fans, baseball fans, you don't really see. Uh, any initial stuff on how the Dodgers are going to have to handle Matt Waldron, Blake? Uh, the old saying is, if it's high, let it fly. If it's low, let it go. I mean, oh. that's kind of the only takeaway you have for a knuckleballer. They're just so unpredictable. Sometimes their yeah. stuff is going to be on and it's going to be almost impossible to hit. And other days they're just not going to have it at all. And they're going to allow like 10 runs in two innings. That's just kind of the nature of knuckleballers. There's been very few who have been able to control it consistently. Like R.A. Dickey had his Cy Young year with the knuckleball and Tim Wakefield, of course, made a career out of it being very good. But a lot of guys, you see like they're not able to have those longer careers with the knuckleball as their primary pitch because it's just such a tough pitch to master and throw. So it'll be interesting to see how the Dodgers counter it. I I can't remember the last time they actually faced a knuckleballer, like not even from a Dodger perspective, just from like any team in major league baseball, it's just such a rare thing. So could be great. Could be a terrible day. I wouldn't put too much stock into it either way, regardless of how it goes, but it'll be fun to watch at minimum. I'm wondering how many how many times Otani's helmet flies off when he un- tries to uncork one. That's what I'm going to be waiting on. Let's set the over under at a six and a half. See. That's uh, under over. What are you taking? I, don't know. If we're, I guess it depends how many at bats he's getting versus Waldron. You take if he gets two, how many times? Five. Two. I'm going to set that at like three and a half. But Waldron's been fine. You know, he's been, you know, I watched, I actually watched his start on April 1st against the Cardinals. He struck out seven, uh, went four, but he allowed four earned. Uh, so he, he gave up nine hits. So it, just like you said, it, you from game to game, those results may vary. Uh, but his most recent one against the Cardinals, he went five and a third, no earned runs. So it's tricky. I mean, the Cardinals are a weird team right now. You just, you really have no clue what you're getting and then how if like effective you are against them because they just, they're not playing the best of baseball and and their offense is really having some issues there. They look old, like their veterans look old. So it's unfortunate, but that's kind of what I'm seeing from them. But it's just a mixed bag, man. Real quick though. Would you believe me if I said the Cardinals had the youngest like team in baseball, like their they, lineup at least. Yeah. I mean, Vic, yeah. Victor but, Scott, like they've got some guys like he's interesting. They're just making some mistakes, but like Aaron Otto looks old Goldschmidt's it just, I don't know. It's, I feel like their lineup and pitching is just completely at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Like they either have the oldest guys in the league or the youngest guys in the league. And it's just funny to see, but like back to the Dodgers, I mean, they just need to put it together versus Waldron. Like we know they have all the talent to actually go out there and hit him, but it's tough to face a knuckleballer. So we'll see how they actually end up doing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, now, you know, Gavin Stone is kind of the guy that, you know, Dodgers, Dodger fans got to see in spring training kind of, you know, Juan Trebo said himself that he earned that last spot in the rotation. Uh, He didn't just, it wasn't gifted because Emmett Sheehan had his injury issues uh, or anybody else. Gavin Stone earned it and he did. I'll, I'll absolutely give him that. He, 
he pitched, he, you know, he pitched a, a hell of a run there in spring training. So I was very happy for him. He just, it, he's made it really difficult on himself. Um, 13, like 13 hits, 2.13 whip. And that's what he's done in two starts, eight earned runs. It's been a tough little go for him. He's had the stuff there. He's still getting the swing and miss. It just feels like when he he's missing again, the same issues that popped up last year when he's missing, he's missing in the big part of the plate and he's putting himself in some pretty predictable counts. And I think it's some of the same issues that Bobby Miller's going through. He's kind of overthrowing a bit and he's not staying in the strike zone as much as he should, which is creating these, these hit, these issues where he's just giving up instant hits. Like, like again, Bobby Miller against Carlos Correa really startled me because there were points when it was just like, you know, he's going to go fastball away here, bang, fastball away, base hit. It just, it's, it's, they're making it tough on themselves and they're missing in real hittable parts of the plate. So for Gavin Stone, are you seeing the same thing I am about a lot of the same issues from last year? Like his stuff looks great. Like it's when it's good, it looks good. But is you feel like he's missing in the same, like heart of the plate, like he was last year? I think when he gets hurt a lot, he is missing with his control and leaving bad pitches over the plate. But I also think it's kind of a combination of things with him. Like he didn't get any help from his defense in his last outing. Mm-hmm. Like he could have easily been out of the first inning without allowing a run, but instead Freddie Freeman made an error and it turned out to be three runs allowed. So I just don't think he's the kind of guy who's going to be able to pitch out of mistakes that his fielders make behind him or anything like the stuff is good, but I wouldn't call it elite. He has five pitches to work with, but I wouldn't really call any of them truly elite pitches. The changeup is very good, but hasn't ranked great stuff plus wise. So I think he's going to be like a prototypical number four starter where you're going to see flashes of upside and you're going to see some struggles from him. That's just kind of the way it goes with pitchers and especially with younger ones. Like, I don't think we should expect ace level outings or consistently good outings every time. He's probably going to have some where he's going to go like seven innings, one or two runs and others where he goes five innings, three or four runs. That's just most number four and five starters do that in baseball. It's hard to Mm -hmm. find good pitching. So with Stone, I think he can be more effective if he gets some help behind him. He has a swing and miss, which is encouraging, but he hasn't had that command that he kind of needs to take it to the next level and be better than what he's been. So he needs to rely on the defense a little more to help him out. And as we kind of know, the Dodgers have had their fair share of defensive struggles this year. And I think that's kind of put Stone in a tough spot. And also, I think it's worth noting, like the last time he pitched, it was rainy and cold yeah, and absolutely. terrible conditions and you got to give some credit there like he didn't do anything to help himself out but it was just a really tough spot for him it's a great point yeah i was fuming about wrigley and i i just i couldn't stand that people are just defending you know the uh ground screw it's just ridiculous what, what stuff from cubs fans man uh but espn game on sunday night so it's going to be that that's exciting you know a lot of hype there uh dodger fans you get to see i know you get to see a familiar face not James Paxson. You get to see you Darvish. 79 and a third in innings pitch career against the Dodgers. Can you believe that? Can you believe he's pitched that many like that much? I like I know, but it like seeing that number, I was like, oh my God. It does seem like he faces the Dodgers every single time they play the Padres, at least once. Every time. Like, every time. It Would it also break. surprise you to know that he has a, a career two two seven ERA against the Dodgers? No, not at all. It feels like every time he faces them, he just completely dominates them, shuts them down. They can't figure it out no matter who they have in the lineup. So, Shoves. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised by that number at all. Or like they have him on the ropes early and then they just don't break through and then he settles in and you're like, okay, they missed their chance. Yeah. Sub one whip 0.87. It's just remarkable stuff from you Darvish against the Dodgers. I know we're this is we're not hyping guys up. We're, we're talking about like career stuff against the Dodgers. It's just stuff that I didn't expect, but I agree with you. Every time he faces, it's like just those familiar faces, you know, uh, it's like any, any, any subpar left-handed pitcher is going to have success against the Dodgers. It's just how it goes. But you Darvish is just a unique case and he's just been a force from the right side and it just absolutely gives them trouble, but he's been really, he's been solid this year. Uh, you know, he only lasted three innings against the Cubs on the 8th of, of, of April 8th, um, through 65 pitches, no decision. So it, it's been a little bit difficult for him recently. He's allowed seven and runs in his last 10 in, 10 innings pitched, but he's been good. He's been good. Three, eight, six ERA in the year. Uh, what are you really looking from the Dodgers to hopefully break through? Like, do you see anything different from the lineup this time around? Or do you think it's going to be a lot of the same that we've seen from you Darvish against the Dodgers? It's hard to say it's going to be anything different until we actually see different. Like the numbers you pointed out, like 
it's been a lot of struggles against you, Darvish. And I think, like you mentioned, they seem to get him kind of on the ropes early, and then he's able to pitch out of it and settle in. And I think a fair point is that's kind of what we were just talking about with Gavin Stone, too. He doesn't have the ability to pitch out of those jams like yeah. Darvish does, and that's kind of where you see the difference in pitchers like that. Gavin Stone throws a lot of pitches. They're not as good. You Darvish throws a lot of pitches, and most of them are pretty elite. And that's able to help him kind of wiggle out of those jams when he gets into them and then settle in and pitch deeper into games. So until the Dodgers like actually show out and are able to hit him consistently and drive runs in, like it's hard for me to say they're going to come out and be different this time, yeah. but hopefully they are. I mean, Darvish has been regressing, even though he's still very good. And the Dodgers have Otani now, and it's not the Korea series and the lineup is playing pretty well overall aside from the bottom three. So there's some hope there, but yeah, I mean, I think if you're kind of guessing what Darvish is going to do, it's hard to say like they're going to light him up or anything. Yeah. And then, you know, going up against him is our, our guy, Blake, our guy, do you want to introduce him? Uh, the big maple, the big maple, our favorite one year contract. I mean, that's yours, you know, mine to Oscar, but our favorite pitching one year contract, but he's been solid. You know, James, James Paxton has, has been solid this year. He's been, uh, you know, I've, we've spoke ad nauseum about how it's, it's important to have this veteran at the back end of the rotation to bridge those innings, to be solid, not spectacular, just solid. And you're going to see times when he's flash, like it'll flash that James Paxton, his first start getting like allowed five walks, but he uh, no earned runs because he was able to pitch out of it. it that was the ultimate tightrope. But against the Twins recently, you went six innings, two and run, two and runs, four strikeouts. He looked great. Only allowed three hits, like earned the win both in both of his decisions. So he stayed in and given the Dodgers a chance to win each time out. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see him against the Padres lineup. I, I there will be some. I hopefully there aren't, but I can see some long balls in there. I just that's just what I can think of from the, the Padres right-handed hitters. It's tough. You've got to go through Bogarts, Manny Machado, you know Tatis. It's that is something that kind of uh i'm not looking forward to seeing and i'm it, i'm looking forward to the test uh same kind of worry for you i think so the padres are a very right-handed heavy lineup especially from their elite bats like they have jake cronenworth as their main lefty bat he might be platoon that game but with paxton i think he's shown he can be an effective pitcher regardless of the lineup he's facing like yeah. last year with boston he had a sub three era for the first half of the season and then he started dealing with some knee injuries and fatigue and gave up, it was like, what, 10 runs in two innings or something, and it just skyrocketed his ERA up. Yeah. So when Paxton's healthy and on the mound, there's not many pitchers who are going to be better than him from the number five spot in a rotation, if there are any at all, which there probably might not be. So he's giving the Dodgers what they need, like five innings, two runs every time out, like you're going to be happy with that from your five starter and anything you get from that is beyond that is extra. So I think we just need to keep seeing more of that from Paxton. I think he has the stuff that he needs to be able to keep doing that. It's just about him staying healthy, staying fresh, not getting overworked. That's great points. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited to see big maple. We'll see what he does. Uh, but we have to talk, you know, have to talk about this topic. I know it's been it's been a little too much, uh, but it will continue to be until it's not. Gavin Lux, Chris Taylor, the, you know, kind of their struggles. A lot of people were asking in in our chat during our live yesterday that we did with Matt and uh, Daniel, which was terrific. Um, do you feel like are you are you kind of over talking about Gavin Lux and Chris Taylor and how much they're struggling, or do you think like I am? I mean. I don't think I'm over talking about it because they're still struggling, but like we need to see results from them. Yeah. It's been pretty brutal. Like Taylor, especially I, it feels like every time he comes up, it's an automatic strikeout and I feel bad for him. I know he's a fan favorite. He has some great moments in Dodger history and he's been kind of on the downtrend for a few years now. And it's tough to see that like, you never want to see guys go through struggles and especially someone like Taylor who has all those history and moments with the Dodgers. Like, yeah, it's just tough to watch Gavin Lux. I'm concerned about, but also I do think it's fair to know he has, he's still rusty in a sense. Like he hasn't played much baseball in so long. So I have a little more optimism. He's going to turn around not much, but 
I think there's more talent there to, than he's actually showing so far. But yeah, we need to actually see them start to pick it up soon. Yeah. So uh, Chris Taylor's 0 for his last 22, 11 strikeouts. I think he's got a 45% walk rate or not walk rate, a strikeout rate in there, 45.8. It looks like he's, is. He, I said it the other day, he's swinging a sledgehammer in slow motion. That's a brutal comp to give a baseball player, but yeah, I can't say it's totally unfair. Yeah. I it's, mean, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It, he's putting them from, from where I'm at. And I know we spoke about this a little bit. He's his struggles are putting the team in a difficult spot that he was just like Kike is a different thing. Kike, you know, he's a, I I don't know what to make of Kike at the moment. I just, I feel like he's got a a, a spot on the roster somewhere and they'll figure that out. But Chris Taylor feels like he's been a reverse splits guy. Uh, He hasn't hit for power uh, recently. That's when he does connect, it'll go whatever, but he's not connecting. He's not making contact there. Defense doesn't slump, but it just feels like he's a different case that he's making such little contact. You don't know what his platoon splits are. He's striking out at such a high clip. You can't trust him in a spot where it's like a gotta be type of scenario. Uh, It feels that similar to like what James Altman goes through when he's at the lowest, that when he's down in the count, you're like, it's a strikeout waiting to happen because he's, he's kind of lost that approach to shorten up and just put the ball in play. So it's a, I know it's early and we can preface that in any single conversation, but like about people who are struggling, but this is what we do. We chat about stuff that shouldn't be chatted about all the time because, but that's fan worry. That's, this is what we do. Uh, But Chris Taylor struggles, just like you said, go back a few years and it's when when it's been bad, it's been the same stuff along the way. It just feels like this year uh, it's gotten off to that start where we're seeing everything happen all at one time. He's not walking. He's striking out at a ridiculously high clip and he's not putting the ball in play. So I, it's all these worries all in one in a spot where they need some consistency in a veteran bat at the bottom. Yeah. He, he's kind of like a three true outcomes player without the main outcome you want to see, which is the Homer mm-hmm. just walks and strikeouts. So it's tough to deal with that. I don't know what the answer is. Like you can say it's a swing issues because he's so mechanics based in his hitting and timing based on that but it's kind of been the same thing for like the last what three years now or something like it's always the swings the issue but he hasn't been able to correct it or figure it out before we had the excuse of maybe it's the neck issue or some other kind of injury coming up but he had the full off season to get healthy and the results still aren't there and yeah. even when he has been healthy you haven't seen them come up as much like he's he does go on his streaks, but we're not really seeing those streaks as much or as often or for as long as the time period. So I don't know what the answer is. Like they might have to get to the point where they DFA him and just kind of move on. But I'm also not sure they do that with such a valued clubhouse guy who can play kind of every position on the diamond and be a good defender at all those positions too. He's valued by a teammates and Dave Roberts. So I'm just not sure, like maybe an IL stint for him, but even then, I just don't know like what the outcome is after that. Like you put him on the IL for 10 days or even 60 days, and then you DFA him after that, you and what? bring yeah. him back and you deal with the issues again. It's just, it's a tough spot they're in. Hopefully he can figure it out. Like maybe there's some sliver of hope there, but it's, it's getting to the point where it's kind of tough to put him in the lineup on any occasion or even have him pinch hit. Yeah, his on base percentage has you know gone down each and like it's it was low in twenty two, last year it was three twenty six, and this year I we have no idea until stuff kind of regulates, which we usually we bank on that happening at some point things will regulate hopefully, and then that might be a trend up for him. But his strikeout rate has done nothing but stay at a high clip for a bit. You know, twenty two it was thirty five point two, thirty two point six last year, and right now, like I said, it's it, the whole whole season it's forty three point eight. So we'll see. Uh, but it's, it's definitely something that, you know, it's, it's worth monitoring and everybody's concerns are incredibly valid. And I think there's more to it than just, it's the early season. Like these aren't early season struggles. He's not going through the same bad luck as James Altman is, and he's not being unfairly, you know, balls and strikes at the plate. It's Chris Taylor in a, in a tough spot. Uh, Gavin Lux, we'll touch on it quick. Uh, the one thing about him is him going from starting shortstop to second baseman to part-time 
platoon guy has put Mookie Betts in a difficult spot, the organization in a weird place. Gavin Lux's defense should not be the thing where we're saying, yep, that's what's locked in on him. That's just an unbelievable turn in about a month. It's just, this is something we, I'm, I have no more words for it because uh, we were hopeful that he was going to figure something out there, that the defense was going to be uh, the worry, but now it's him actually going up there. I know he's been some tough calls to the plate, but now it's like, where, where, where are you and Gavin Lux? Like, what are we actually going to see with him? What, what's going to break right for this guy? Uh, my honest answer is I'm still on the train or the car ride, driving him to Milwaukee or yeah. to the airport and that Willie Adamas trade. The other you and answer, me both, buddy. The other answer is I feel like he can still be a fine everyday second baseman, but for what the Dodgers need, it's not that. Like they need to put Mookie Betts back at second base and find yeah. an actual answer at shortstop. Yeah. Mookie has done very well considering all the circumstances at shortstop, but there's also errors you're seeing him make where another shortstop probably wouldn't make those errors. And they're putting more stress on his body, which is something they wanted to avoid, especially with one of their big three guys in the lineup. So it's not an ideal situation for him to be in. Like, even if they can manage it throughout the year, there's still a long-term answer at shortstop you need to find. And yeah. that's going to push Gavin Lux out of a job there too. So it feels like he's just kind of an odd man out that's being stuck into a starting role with the team. Like, Gavin Lux can have a 110 weighted red screen plus season and three war. And like, I wouldn't be surprised. And like, that's a good player. Any organization would love to have that on their team, but for what the Dodgers need, it just doesn't really fit with position wise. Yeah. Maybe they can move him to the outfield, but when we've seen that it didn't go particularly well. So I'm just not sure like what they're going to end up doing there. I would prefer, maybe prefer to see Miguel Rojas get some more playing time. He has been hitting somewhat well. And while I'm not sure I expect him to keep that up, at least you're getting the defense there. But Rojas also isn't a guy who's going to be able to play every single day at this point in yeah. his career. So maybe they kind of end up platooning them essentially, which is a little bit what they've already done. They haven't fully committed to it and Dave Roberts won't admit to it, but if they can kind of make that more official and just, so Gavin Lux knows, like, there's a righty, I'm going to be playing. There's a lefty, I'm going to be sitting. Like, I think it does help from the mental standpoint of knowing when you're going to play and all that kind of stuff. So it's just another tough spot that they're in. And it is just kind of funny. Like, we went into the spring training, like, Gavin Lux's defense is going to be the problem, but his bat's going to keep him in the lineup. And now we're talking about his defense is keeping him in the lineup, but his bat's a problem. And just funny how those things work out. Yeah, I, I just, I, and... I don't know. It's just such a weird thing. Uh, fan driven segment, by the way. So thank you, chat. I appreciate it. That's brought to you by Dodger hands, Scott Gearman, Blake Williams. It's just, I just don't know what to make of the guy. So we, I, we have to move on. I'm tired of talking about Gavin Lux. He needs to turn around, figure it out, dude. We'll be here to hype it up when it happens. But uh quick segment on T Oscar, uh, James Paxson from Dave Roberts. Everyone has to hear this too bad. Blake and I are going to, rally around each of them because there are signings of the off season and they're doing fantastic. The Oscars doing a, a big job and the big maples doing another big job. Like what'd you hear from uh, Dave? Yeah. So Dave Roberts basically called them two of the most undervalued signings in baseball. He said, I think for me, it's two guys that really wanted to be here. Both of them left money on the table. And when those are players that are accomplished, it shows you that they've already bought in and that they want to be here. And then he said, I think for some people, they're sneaky moves, but people in the baseball industry really understand the value of those two players. I just value those guys so much. You know what you're going to get from both guys, dependable players and very valuable. So that's pretty high praise from a manager there. You don't get that kind of praise too often. So, yeah, I mean, they're doing everything what we wanted them to do and probably even more like Teoscar has exceeded expectations, I think. Most people would probably say Paxton has exceeded expectations so far. So it's good to see them both performing and doing well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. I mean, I know they said it on the broadcast the other day about T Oscar and it's the same thing I've been echoing since they signed him. He's a true RBI guy. And there's some players just like JD Martinez that are true RBI guys. 
And when I know it's uh, it's it's something that I know I know no Blake smiling over here if you're listening he's he's giggling it up but there are guys that just when they're runners on base they that's their job and it's who it is and that's I know Matt is going to jump up and down when he hears me saying this but that is the old old school fan in me that there are players there are hitters in the box that truly understand that you have a job to do when you're up there with runners on base you knock them in. I know it's everybody's job, but that's just who he is. He's going to strike out. He's striking out a high clip right now. He's not walking a lot, but when he's putting the ball in play, he's doing damage. He's knocking him in, you know, and I think he's going to continue to do that. So shout out to Dave Roberts for acknowledging that. And and we're going to golf clap for each other. Blake, tip our cap to us. We were dialed in on that one. There'll be more along the way. My Nabil Chris Matt will be back up in the big league soon. Uh, and this brings us to bullpen management. Uh, it's something that I I wrote a, a fairly ridiculously long editorial for Dodger Blue about, and that'll come out, uh, it should be out today. Uh, but I feel like bullpen management is always a topic, and because it is, there's always someone who's going to blow a game, and then they're going to yell at the TV, why did you put him in, Dave Roberts? It's just, but at this point of the year, with as many long men, there's two long men in the bullpen. Let's not act like Michael Grove is a one inning reliever or Ryan Yarbrough is a one inning reliever at all. So a lot of their numbers are skewed because of that. And there's been some guys who have exploded those numbers. So they're, we're going to leave ERA out of this at the moment. Um, but Blake, overall, do you feel like the, like any issues or like worries about the bullpen are kind of overblown right now? Yes and no. Like, I think everyone knows my issues with relievers. They're very well documented of yes. you never know what you're going to get with relievers. Correct. And I think they have maybe not performed as well as we would hope. But on the other hand, they have a lot of guys on the IL right now. And they also made a strange decision to send Kyle Hurt to the minor leagues. And I think he was probably their third best reliever. Yes. So they've kind of taken away options, whether that be from decisions or health wise from Dave Roberts to make those moves. And it's put them in a little bit more of a tough spot. Like we didn't expect the Nelson Lamette and Nabil Chris Matt type pitchers to be on the roster already, but that's where we are at this point. I think they've also been put into a little bit more of a probably tough spot because of the rain that they had they were dealing with a lot of their starters had either shorter outings or just weren't able to go as deep from some of their struggles as well so they've kind of relied on them more than you would hope so but so far i think you can say like the guys you expect to be good are good which is a positive thing like evan phillips is locked in and i think that's fair to say he's probably going to be locked in like that for most of the year he's kind of earned that elite reliever title already and then hopefully once you start getting guys back like Bruce Dargratterall eventually and hopefully Blake Trining can come back, it'll kind of lengthen the bullpen a bit more, give him more matchups and abilities to get hitters out there, pick and choose the matchups they want to play there. And then I think it's also worth noting like Daniel Hudson has been phenomenal. It's kind of been kind of like we didn't know what to expect from him after not pitching in so long, but he's come back and picked up right where he left off. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to leave everybody a little tease. I hope you, know, hope you read my bullpen management thing and scroll down to the bottom. When you get to see my uh, Dodgers bullpen circle of trust, we're going to keep updating that as much as we go. Uh, you want to name, there's four names. You want to name the four that are in there? So I'm guessing here, um, Evan Phillips, of course, is one. Yep. Daniel Hudson is two. We're not talking about injured guys, right? Like, No. Okay. Uh, Ryan Brazier, I'm guessing, yep. is on there. I would say Kyle Hurd if we're going to include him, but like, probably not. Um, why do I feel like you're going to say Vessia for some reason? No, I'm not going to. Even though, <laughs> even though Vessia has been given Vessia, I've been, I've, I've been on this narrative. No, it's Nabil Chris, man, and that's why because that butterfly changeup was looking amazing. I know, whatever. It's my narrative. I'm going to run with it. That's just how it goes. That's just how it is. Narrative lives on. I'm going to sneak it in. Read that, read it, and everybody can weep because I wrote more about him than the three other relievers on that list. Uh, but that's it. I'm not, no, that's mine, yeah. mine, and my own. Weep, forget about you, it. I'm, you can't I'm put Chris Matt and leave off Kyle Hurt. There's no way. I, I think he can start games. I'm I think he can start games. Edits. There's huh? going to be some, there's going to be some edits to that to add in Kyle Hurt. Yeah, go ahead and do whatever you want. No, it's mine. It's my editorial. Leave it alone. Uh, but 
I th- yeah, Daniel Hudson, absolutely. He's he's been terrific. Six innings, strike seven strikeouts, no walks. He walked people. Everybody's walking people in spring training like crazy. Like he's buckled down and been everything. So I think that they're they're it feels like they're protecting guys a bit. They're spacing them out like a ton, which is fine early on in the year. But I just hope that just for the sake of having these multi-inning arms, Michael Grove and Ryan Yarbrough, they're not like just not punting games, but they're missing opportunities for some of these high end relievers to, uh, to have more appearances. And we saw with Vessia, he came in there and gave him an an immediate homer. And that was the game decider, uh, just because it was a lefty lefty matchup. But I've, I've been in the last few days, been really on the train that Alex Vessia is a fine left-handed pitcher, but he should not be a number one option out of the bullpen. They're just in a spot where, or number one, yeah, number one left-handed pitcher out of the bullpen. He's a two without a doubt. They're just in a spot where who else do they have? Uh, but it's also a good, it goes back to the offseason where they neglected to really address that. And I don't think Caleb Ferguson's the answer. People are going to say, Scott, you've said this every single time you're on this topic, but it's true. I didn't like Caleb Ferguson. I didn't think Caleb Ferguson was an elite reliever. Whatever. I didn't. I don't think he is. It's, he's, I don't think he's a, an elite left hand, lefty, lefty guy. Like they can absolutely do better there. And Nick Ramirez is not like if he's the answer, then cool. But if it's at the deadline, then that's what they'll t- they'll have to attack. But Alex Vessia's stuff is like uh, when he when he's bad, he's bad and giving up homers, and that's relief pitchers. But they've just kind of put him in spots where it's like, okay, you just gave up a homer yet, uh, the you know days three days ago, two days ago, he gives up gives up another one. It's just a tough tough go for the guy. Like it's just he shouldn't be the number one lefty out of the bullpen. Yeah, so I think the thing with Vessi is he goes on streaks where sometimes he'll look like one of the best relievers in baseball, and then yeah. other times he'll be one of the worst, worst relievers in baseball and giving up homers constantly. Like, even the, in the years he was good, they sent him down to the minors to kind of work on some things. So I have some faith Vessia will figure it out. I think he's more talented than he's kind of shown or what people actually give him credit for. I think maybe the pitch clock has kind of affected him a bit because – it does seem to coincide with that a lot, but also like for you here, how did you go through that entire like rant and not name Drew Pomeranz, my guy that they signed to a minor league deal that's going to come How's up and save? I have no idea. I that's what I'm saying. I know how stats, but, has been. But, but Pomeranz, he's the guy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Bring him up. Whatever. This is not a Quackenbush situation where we do we just know it's just for the meme, but this is like a situation where there could be some real upside there. And we all know that relievers come out of nowhere. Evan Phillips came out of nowhere. That's just how they do these things. Brian Brazier was dead on the field before he got into the Dodgers organization. So uh, let's see if Pryor can work some magic here. Um and that's just what we have to do. We have to wait and see. I don't think it's an area that they need to be hyper aggressive and targeting. It's just not how it is. And to what you were speaking about, about Blake Trina and Bruce Dark Gratterall not being here. Uh, the topic from, I think, you and I was that you don't necessarily need left-handed options to get left-handed hitters out. Like, we got to see, really see how, like, I know he's a starter, but we got to see how Tyler Glass now could bury the slider into lefties and give him absolute fits and and that's what Blake Trinan possesses. Bruce Dark Gratterall has been terrific in developing his stuff to get both sides of the plate out. So they might have been fairly confident that they don't need those options to be, you know, at the top of their top of their board and and something that they have to really, you know, focus on getting into the bullpen. You know, they wanted some interchangeability, I think. Uh, and they Vessia's Vessia's turnaround last year, uh, since they called him up on let's see, July sixth through the end of the year, he had a two three five. Uh, ERA three three two FIP, so he was terrific. So there was some there that they were you know, probably confident that he could carry that load, and he was back to being who he was. So it's just you can pick and choose what you want to believe. Uh, sample size for relievers, uh, but Alex Vesey at this point, uh, he's just not as top end. He just I don't think he was ever top end. He was just reliable and consistent. So we'll see if there's an area or if Drew Pomeranz is the guy, and then we'll I'll drive over to your house and I'll carry you around the block. Yeah, and real quick, since we're on bullpen management and kind of talking about that, I think I have to give my little speech I end up giving about this. Like, there isn't a manager in baseball that's going to make good bullpen decisions consistently. There's a lot of things that go into each thing. Like, you can't play to win your hardest every single night. Like, 
you can't have Evan Phillips pitch in 162 games. It's just not realistic. And no matter which manager the Dodgers have or which manager you want them to have, like you're going to end up complaining about bullpen decisions at some point because first of all, you're trying to predict things and predicting never is consistent. Like there's going to be things that happen that you couldn't predict and expect and relievers are going to have good nights and they're going to have bad nights. And there's just, there's a lot of variables that go into pitching decisions in each game. I'm not saying Dave Roberts is necessarily like good at bullpen management and making those decisions about matchups and all that. But I also don't think he's necessarily the worst. Like I think a lot of fans make him out to be. And I think if anyone who wants to criticize him goes and watches another game and kind of like does the same nitpicking at other managers, like you're going to see the same things across the league because that's just how it goes. Like there's no manager who's going to be perfect with their pitching decisions or probably even great. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and everyone looking at things like it, stuff will regulate. Like a lot of these, they're figuring out roles for them and workloads are building up. And um, it also doesn't help when Joe Kelly comes in and he was supposed to be a, a reliable arm and he's just had some hiccups there. So everybody's kind of feeling it out. The bullpen, give it some time. Uh, they'll workloads will build up guys in the AAA that should have a spot in the big league roster will be there. And hopefully they you know, get slapped upside the head about Michael Grove and understand who he really is. Uh, but I'm Scott Gearman. This is Blake Williams. I uh, appreciate everyone for joining us. Make sure you slam that like subscribe button. Uh, we're going to be out here as much as we possibly can. Uh, I love being on here with Blake. We've got some, some pretty good ideas coming up. Uh, hopefully everyone enjoys this series against the Padres. Uh, it should be an interesting one. I'm really curious to see how they can kind of, they already did. We'll say this, but this is the first home uh, series against the San Diego Padres. So I'm interested. I'm really curious to see how it's going to be. Um, we'll see if the Dodgers can really light it up early and keep that pressure on there and kind of establish some early dominance in the National League West. Anything last from you, Blake? Uh, no, I think we kind of covered everything. Uh, just looking forward to the series as well. And it's always fun with the Padres and Dodgers, even if we don't consider it as much of a rivalry as Padre fans do. So we'll see. Hopefully we can kind of like show them we're still the top team in the West and will be for Dang. a long time. There he is. My guy, Blake. All right, everybody. Appreciate it. You take care. Don't, don't forget. Don't forget. Slam the like button. Subscribe. Notification bell. We'll see you next time. Later, guys.